So can you guys hear me? Is the mic working out okay? Fine. So in the last session of the day, we finally managed to get the IT working. That's, that's usually the case for every IT conference I go to. So usually it's, it, it's somewhere between the last day of the conference and the last session. So my name is Philipp Leitner. I'm coming all the way from the University of Zurich, which is about half an hour of car ride. So it's probably one of the... Uh, one of the closest conferences I've ever been attend uh, I've ever been in attendance to, so that's very good. And um, I will be um, I will be doing something a little bit different than most of the talks we have heard here today. So many of the talks we heard over the day, which were all super interesting, but they were all relatively broad. So they were all um, they were all uh, like, what are cloud native applications? Was one of the questions we basically heard about today. And what I will be doing is I will be doing a very academic thing. I will be trying to answer one super, super specific and small question. So the question that I want to answer is basically this one. I don't know if you can see it. How predictable is the performance of infrastructure as a service uh, instances? So this is a relatively small question that, uh, that I hope I will be able to give you some answer in the course of the next 30 or so minutes. And another caveat is, Unlike many other talks that we heard so far, I will be only talking about public infrastructure as a service cloud. So I will not be talking about OpenStack. I will not be talking about um, you building your own data center. I will really only be talking about um, you as a software engineer, as a startup, trying to find a cheap way how to run your own cloud services. And um, basically, the reason why I come from this sort of end user perspective is because um, I'm actually working in the software evolution and architecture lab, so I'm really not a, uh, we're not data center guys at that, uh, in that sense. What we really are is we are, we are people that work on how to build applications for the cloud. So we're not, we're not, we're not interested in building our own, uh, our own data centers. We're interested in finding a cheap way how to run our own applications in a public cloud. And well, for this, one of the questions we figured out that's relatively interesting for people is how predictable is the performance? And here is the, another caveat that I should already warn you before, into, uh, before I go into more detail is today I will only be talking about predictability. I will only be talking about how much, uh, to what extent do I know in advance what performance I get from a public IS cloud. I will not be talking about the absolute values. I have the absolute values, but I'm not really going into them today because they change all the time. They're not really all that interesting. If I tell you today that, for instance, Azure is slower than uh, Amazon, it's not really something that's super useful uh, for you because Amazon might be rolling out new servers tomorrow and then the, this information is basically void. So what I will be talking about more is what kind of variability can you expect when you have decided on a given IES cloud instance and why does this even matter? And Let's first focus on the why part. And here I have, I, I can keep this super short because the good thing is a lot of that has already been covered today only from a slightly different angle. So I'm, funny enough, I also have the same kind of keyword as we heard in the last presentation, this notion of cloud sizing. Surprise, surprise, this also exists if you are uh, in a, in a, in, if you are a customer in a, in, a, in a public cloud. Maybe you're not building your own OpenStack cloud, but still, nobody comes to you and tells you how many instances you need. Nobody, uh, nobody comes to you and tells you whether you should be using a bare metal cloud or your, your own, uh, uh, your, or, or a, a regular virtual uh, cloud. Nobody comes to you and tells you whether you should be using provisioned IOPS. Nobody comes to you and tells you whether you should be using um, a, a bunch of small instances or a couple of very large instances. So the basic kind of prom, uh, problem of, of, of figuring out what the optimal uh, size for your deployment in an infrastructure service cloud is, this also exists in a public cloud, even if you're only a user there. And this basically boils down to the three big questions, sorry, this basically boils down to the three big questions here. Finding the, your right cloud provider, Amazon, Azure, SoftLayer, one of the small Swiss companies that we heard about today. Finding out what services you want from them, Lambda, EC2, and then figuring out what kind of configurations you actually need. And for instance, in, in, in your typical infrastructure as a service cloud, you have a bunch of different instance types, you have a bunch of different configuration options, you have a bunch of different uh, regions, data centers, uh, and whatnot to choose from. And then in the last step, and obviously I cannot count, so this is still three, should be four, uh, then you have to deploy your application, provision your application, and then at some point you would probably start to actually see your application running and, 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 and profit from that. So. One thing we figure out is 
I mean, it's a question of, of argument whether cloud, whether, whether doing this sizing in your, in your, in your, uh, in your open stack, in your own private cloud is harder than in, a, in if you just need to go to a, to a public cloud and you just basically need to make do with what is already there. But in any way, what we see a lot is when we talk to, 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 to people is cloud sizing is still super, super difficult. Even if you just go to, uh, even if you are, even if you decide to use a public offering, it's still very difficult to figure out how to do this in the best way. And there's basically two kind of hurdles that people have. Is the, the first one is there are just a whole lot of services out there. It's the cloud market is extremely intransparent. There is a bunch of them out there. The service, if you just look at the infrastructure layer, to some extent, the service is relatively comparable that you get. But there is just a lot of different options out there. And then, of course, the cloud providers are almost by definition not particularly transparent with what they're actually giving to, uh, to you. Amazon used, uh, they're getting better, but Amazon used to have this, 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 this website where they listed the different instance types. And for instance, they used to list for network performance medium. So there was basically a, a big table that told you one instance type has a medium network performance. This, if you try to do capacity planning for your application, this basically doesn't help. And then, and now we come back to the, to the, to the predictability part. Then when you actually start looking at these different instance uh, types, what you actually find out is that you have another problem when you try to size your, 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 your IES deployment in the right way which is that when you start trying out uh, different instance types, what can happen to you is the thing uh, like uh, what, what you see here on the right-hand side. You, so this is, this is real-life data from Amazon in, uh, in, in the Dublin data center for a large instance type. And basically what we did in order to generate this graph is we ran for 72 hours. We ran on, on two different instances, identical configuration, same hourly cost. We just kept re-executing an I.O. benchmark. This was sort of a, um, a mixed read-write uh, workload for an I.O. benchmark. We just kept re-executing the same kind of uh, benchmark every hour. And this was one instance, and this was, one, uh, was the other instance. And obviously, what you, what you see very easily in this single graph is they're not the same performance. One of them is twice as fast as the other one, even though they cost the same amount of money. And even worse, obviously, the red instance is also much more stable. So you also have, it, it's much clearer to you that, or it, it's pretty clear to you, if you actually want to build a small web server in Amazon, you would much rather be on that instance than on that instance, obviously. But the problem is there's no way to know. It's very hard when you do capacity planning, it's very hard to figure out whether you're gonna be in that instance or that instance, or you're gonna have a combination of them in the various different components in your system. And they also may, may change. So what you see here towards the end of our experiment, you saw that the, the performance of these instances was kind of, they, they, they're changing. So it's not that when you figure out you're in a good instance, it's not that this needs to be like that until the end of the lifetime of the instance. These things can change. So to kind of go back to this in, uh, initial question that I was asking, how predictable is the performance of an instance in a public IS cloud? Well, the answer is, well, not very. And that kind of sucks for cloud sizing because now we have the problem, not only do we have these many, many intransparent offerings, they might also be, behave completely differently one day than what they, uh, how they behave on the next day. So that's kind, that's kind of depressing. If we go into the larger answer and look at more than just two instances that we randomly started and looked at, um, we can see that in fact, it's not that we, ha that we have no idea about the performance of, of infrastructure as a service clouds. So here's a, a big, big table of a lot of numbers. So basically what you see here in this, in this, uh, in this table is the results. The, the, it's kind of an overview of a lot of benchmarking results that we ran over multiple months last year. And basically what we did is we had tooling that allowed us to schedule five different benchmarks. So this was a CPU microbenchmark, a memory microbenchmark some application benchmark that compiled the Java mm -hmm. application, uh, this I.O. benchmark that I showed earlier, and uh, a, a database benchmark. And we just kept for about 80 different configurations in uh, EC2, in Google Compute Engine, in Azure, and in SoftLayer. We just defined a bunch of different configurations, and we just kept re-executing the same benchmark on different instances over and over and over again. We collected about, I think, close to 60, uh, 60 or 70,000 data points this way over the course of multiple months. 
And then basically what you see here in this, uh, in this kind of table here is, you see the relative standard deviations of the results we got for identical benchmark runs. So this, these numbers here give you an indication of how predictable a given workload, a given benchmark would be in a given cloud provider in a given region. So if you go, for instance, here to this 12.14, this would tell you that in, our, uh, in the Ireland region, a micro instance, uh, the, the CPU benchmark for a micro instance, you would have an expectation of about 12% variation in the, in, the, in the performance between different runs. Um, and obviously, there's kind of a helpful color coding. The red things are obviously much worse than the, than the, than the, than the white fields. And what you can see here is, it's not that it's just everything's red. There's definitely some things that are super, super predictable. Generally speaking, CPU benchmarks relatively predictable, though not here, curiously, but we will get into that later on. Uh, I.O. benchmarks, super, super unpredictable, except here, which I can also talk to you a little bit about. <coughs> so let's, let, let's dive into this into a little bit more detail. So first of all, the good news is, if you care about pred predictability, and not everybody does, I'm going to come to that towards the end of my presentation, but if you care about predictability, and this matters to you a lot, then there are certain cloud providers that are much more suitable to you than others. Specifically in our benchmarks, Google and SoftLayer were both quite predictable across, the, uh, across pretty much all of our tests. Amazon was kind of a mixed bag, and Azure traditionally has very, very, uh, let's say, unpredictable performance, basically across all tests. So cloud provider is one thing. The second thing that matters, which is kind of obvious, but I'm still, I, I, I like to explain this. The second thing that matters quite a bit is what kind of instance type you're using. And here the simple rule is, you can see it here for, the, for Amazon in North America, the larger the instance becomes, the more predictable it becomes. So basically, pretty much definitionally, the micro instance with the bursting, um, uh, with the, the, the shared CPU, super, super unpredictable. Small instance already still very unpredictable, and starting from large, you basically don't see any variability in a, in a CPU benchmark anymore. So the different, the different instance types, and, and this is kind of a rule we saw across pretty much all workloads and all providers. The larger you are, the more willing you are to pay for a more expensive instance type, the more predictability you also get. So if you go and buy a larger, uh, light, larger instance type, you will also get higher predictability in comparison to the cheap entry-level instances. And then the third thing, and this is something that uh, I will explain in a little bit more detail, is what also matters quite a bit is what kind of workload, what kind of application you're actually talking about. Not all applications and not all tests have the same kind of, let's say, uh, distribution in terms of unpredictability. So if you look at this Java application benchmark, this is largely quite predictable. If you look at the I.O. micro benchmark, all over the place. So if we go into this, in a little bit more detail, so that was the 15-minute clock, I think. <laughs> uh, if we go into this uh, in a little bit more detail, and this has basically nothing to do with cloud computing in that sense. Uh, this is something that people see in, 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 in capacity planning in all kinds of, of contexts. But um, there's kind of two sort of big groups of, of workloads, of applications that you need to, to, to keep in mind when you, when you want to build your cloud application. The one is, applications that are defined by how fast your CPU are, and the bottleneck for that kind of applications is what kind of CPU model you actually have in your, in your, in, in your cloud instance. Probably not, not most of the applications, but the, there's a bunch of those applications out there. And then the second kind of group is I.O. bound slash network bound applications. I say I.O. bound slash network bound because what we see is that many uh, in, in most cloud providers nowadays, uh, I.O. and network is pretty much the same thing as, as you pretty much always talk about uh, 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 NAS storage. So in this kind of, uh, what, we see for, sorry, what we see here is that CPU-bound benchmarks are in most providers, we had, ex uh, we had exceptions before and I'm going to talk about them, but in most providers, these CPU benchmarks and the CPU-bound uh, applications are going to be very, very predictable. And they're very easy to do capacity planning for while the I.O. bound ones are much harder uh, to, to predict. So this kind of raises the question, why do these different workloads behave so differently? And here, let, let me start with the much easier question to answer, which is why are the I.O. bound applications so unpredictable? And here the reason is very simple, it's, it's multi-tenancy. Basically, how Amazon and how any cloud provider makes money is by 
packing together as tightly as possible or as commercially feasible the different uh, um, uh, tenants on, on, onto, their, onto their instances. And what happens to you is not all cloud providers or not all tenants on a cloud are using the same resources in the same kind of way. So if you happen to, if you happen to be on a rack where people are not using the network because they just started a couple of test instances and then didn't actually use them or because they just had workloads that didn't use the network, then your network performance is great. If you happen to land on a rack where other people are also blocking your, uh, your, 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 your network, then your network performance is, is really, really bad. And there's not much that you can do about it from the outside. It's just something that you need to be aware of and keep in mind. And this also explains to us why this situation changes over time. Because obviously, the neighbors that you have on your rack, they're not set in stone. It's not like over the course of time, virtual machines are terminated. They are, they are, they are, uh, new virtual machines are created. Maybe for some uh, providers, virtual machines might be migrated from one rack to the other. So it's not clear just because you have very nicely behaving neighbors now, it's not clear that this will be also true three days from now. And this also explains to us a little bit why the CPU is much more, um, uh, why, why CPU performance is much more stable. Simply because the CPU in general is not shared. So you're not sharing the CPU with anybody else uh, in, in, your, in, most of in, in most of the instances that you will have. So you're not seeing the multi-tenancy in these kind of, uh, for, for CPU-bound applications. Which kind of gives you the question, why do we see any CPU, any variation in CPU-bound benchmarks at all? And we had this example with Azure where we had this 10 to 20% variation in CPU results. And here, the answer is something, uh, so, so, some, something somewhat interesting because in some cloud providers, not in all of them, but in some cloud providers, you see a concept that is called hardware heterogeneity. And that basically just boils down to the fact that data centers are not built from scratch all the time. They grow over time. They're kind of or organic. Amazon is constantly rolling out new servers and replacing old servers. So what happens to you is something like that. And this is, again, data from, from, from our study. This is, these are the different um, CPU models we saw from the different cloud providers for the same instance types. So remember, we are paying the same amount of money for these instances, but in a, for Azure here, for about 50% of the instances, we got an AMD uh, CPU, and about, for about 50%, we got two versions of Intel CPUs. And obviously, our performance depends on which of these instances we get. So this is something that you see also for CPU-bound um, CPU workloads. The good thing here is this is something very easy to figure out. So you can, uh, you can start an instance. If you care about that, check the CPU. And if, you, if, if the CPU is not the one that you want, you can just get rid of it again and start, uh, and, and start anew. This is actually something that a, that a bunch, of, this is actually something that a bunch of, of cloud tenants actually do. They just start an instance, check the hardware, do a little bit of benchmarking. If they're not satisfied, try again. Um, that being said, you should, in, in practice, you should really very much care about the multi-tenancy and not so much about the hardware heterogeneity. So one of the reasons is that if you have no idea about your application, it's much more likely to be I.O. bound than, uh, than, than, than CPU bound. Uh, the second reason is that most of the cloud providers are nowadays, for most of the instance types that you should care about as a company, they're kind of moving away from this, multi uh, from this hardware heterogeneity. So this is... This is kind of a, a, a snapshot currently from EC2. What you can see here is that for all the general purpose instances, you kind of get a guaranteed hardware model nowadays. In Azure, it's still not the case, but for most cloud providers, including Google, SoftLayer, Amazon, and most others, you're currently guaranteed a specific model of hardware. So this hardware heterogeneity is not really that big of an issue anymore nowadays. So now the question obviously becomes, <coughs> When you have all this kind of unpredictability, what can you actually do? And there's basically three sort of approaches how you can deal with that. And solution one is very, very obvious. Every cloud provider is a business. So, and they're, of course, aware that, uh, of this unpredictability. So all of them give you, in various ways, ways to pay your way out of this unpredictability. You can pay for provisioned IOPS, which is basically a service level agreement on your I.O. performance. You can Pay, pay for a bare metal cloud where I don't have multi-tenancy and don't have virtualization. You can pay for a dedicated instance where I don't have multi-tenancy. Or you can just over-provision. I mean, if you have 
way too many instances, then maybe you don't really care so much about the unpredictability of them anyway. Uh, anyway. So this is one thing that you can do. And, and in, in, in reality, this is the solution that a lot of customers actually go for. They just account for the unpredictability and over provision. The second thing that you can do, and this kind of is a nice segue to a lot of the other talks we heard today, you can play the numbers game. So here's the thing. If you if your application is a monolith and you're running it on three big virtual machines, then you care very much about the performance of each of your virtual machines. If you build your application using a microservice uh, uh, architectural style and your application is running in 200 Docker containers, then the individual variations of each container isn't really something that you are very interested in because they're just, the, the, the statistical law of big numbers is just making sure that your application kind of converges against the medium here. And then, of course, the third thing you can do is you can do what we do. You can just do benchmarking experiments. You can just build a small benchmark, run some workloads, figure out which application or which cloud providers and which, um, which um, instance types are the ones that bring you the best compromise of cost, performance, predictability, stability. And to that end, what we have is uh, the tooling that we use to uh, generate our own data. This is open source, so you can go to GitHub. Uh, GitHub uh, usage uh, cloud uh, dash workbench, and you can find there uh, this 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 open source tool that we built to run our own benchmarks, and it's very flexible. You can the basic principle of this tool is you use uh, Chef to basically define your uh, benchmark as a as a as a recipe, and then you define the instance type that you want to benchmark as a vagrant file, and then you can run. Uh, then you can basically schedule here. You, you see it uh, maybe. You see here, this is a cron job where you can define when this benchmark should be run, and then, you, then the, the tooling collects all the data, and then you can do whatever you want with the data. You can, you, you can figure out what the, uh, what the results of your, of your tests were. So this is something you can definitely do. So this already brings me toward the end of my talk. So basically, the key message is to take away. The, performance of a public infrastructure as a service cloud is not necessarily very predictable. Some things are predictable, but a lot of, for a lot of workloads you will see that if you just keep re-executing the same kind of tests, the results vary much more than what you're used to from running your own data centers. And the two major reasons for that are multi-tenancy on the one hand, which you really cannot do much against from a, from a, from a customer's point of view, and hardware heterogeneity, which is slightly less important in the sense simply because most cloud providers have, are already dealing with that anyway. And then, of course, an architectural way to deal with this problem, which is a, a relatively smart way to deal with this problem in the first place, is to build your application as a cloud-native application, play the numbers game, scale up, and uh, be well set up to deal with uh, performance variations of all your containers and all your infrastructure in a, let's say, in, 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 a, in a smart and resilient way. Okay, so more information about that is in the paper that we wrote. Uh, you can Google it, it's free. You, can, you, you don't need to be subscribed to any university to, to download it. There's a bunch more data in the paper. Um, and you can also see what kind of benchmarks we ran and what kind of schedules we had and all the technical details if you're interested in it. Um, if you just want to talk more about that, you can either catch me or one of my students who are over there on the left side, <laughs> and or you can send me a, a tweet on Twitter. So I'm usually very active there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, maybe there are some reactions to your talk. You may, I have, I'm wondering if, if you um, tried um, I'm running a script um, and um, really couple it with the deployment itself and tried out um, hammering the numbers of deployments and checking before the, the performance and, and if not, a, a, let's say, defined performance reach, just starting a redeployment. If maybe cloud provider reacting on that, that they try to, to um, not be able to do that or not? Uh, you mean, okay, I think, l let me repeat the question briefly. Yeah. So I think the question was whether we have checked whether the cloud provider is aware of our experiments and then behaves differently. Yeah. Um, we haven't explicitly checked that, but what we can do is, basically what you can do is, and we did that, you can see whether the statistical distribution over your, like we have 
for each configuration, we have about 500 or 600 results, and we can see whether the statistical distribution changes over time. So if what you said uh, was true, then we would see that first the instance would be very slow, and then it would suddenly become much faster, so because the cloud provider gives us priority for our results or whatever. Uh, and we haven't actually seen that, so the, the, the distribution doesn't really change. And this also makes a lot of sense because I mean, I said we ran large-scale, quote, unquote, uh, experiments for us, but for Amazon or, or for Azure, that's a, that's a drop in the ocean. The, like, starting a, start, starting a couple dozen instances for every day for a couple of, of, of months isn't really some... That, that's not really abnormal behavior for them. That's not really something that would make somebody investigate here. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm aware of the, of, uh, the, the, there's a bunch of work out there, there's actually frameworks out there. Most of them are actually built for the, to, to, to make use of this hardware heterogeneity because that's much easier to gain than the multi-tenancy part because the, the, the CPU that you get, first of all, it's very easy to figure out whether you are on a fast CPU or on an old model and it also never changes. So gaming the multi-tenancy part is difficult and substantially less reliable because it can change over time. Um, and here, I mean, one of the reactions is just most cloud providers are not doing that anymore. So the, the entire approach, uh, approach has kind of lost a little bit of its appeal over the last two years. Um, what, you, what you would do as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, um, uh, a cloud provider to prevent gaming of the multi-tenancy part, I would say the answer is you're probably not doing anything against that because at the end of the day, your customers are sort of load balancing themselves in a way, right? I, I don't think it's a, it, it's a problem for you if people are doing that. 